Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Michael Hare. I work with the uh, Rothman Institute. I've been with them since 2010. And this is just a quick talk on arthritis. Uh, and as you know, you can get in touch with us through these numbers. Probably the most important thing with um, your life is just maintaining your ability to function, playing with your kids, playing with your grandkids, uh, going to the boardwalk, gardening. Uh, going out with the family and having fun. And it's amazing how your life is limited when you can't do the simple activities. These are my babies a long time ago. Now they're adults. I uh, you know, walking on the boardwalk and noticeably absent from this is the grandparents because they have bad knees. These are the grandparents. The one standing in the back with the red hair can't bend over. She had knee replacements uh, shortly after this picture was taken, but her ability to participate and have fun was so necessary to get this done. So she ended up getting her joints done. This is um, the other grandfather, the one who got for a walk with his grandson. He's able to do so because he has normal healthy joints. My daughter pointing to our three mile walk on the mountain ridge pass up in Hershey she is so proud of this, uh, but none of this can you do with bad joints. I really enjoy fishing, and it's uncanny how just the simple gentle rocking motion of a boat can take an arthritic person and have them unable to participate with fishing. This is my father who goes with me on every trip, and the reason he can go with me is this. He has an unloader knee brace, and that unloader brace gives him the stability and the painless function he needs in order to participate and come out with us and enjoy the great outdoors. I never knew how many people in this world love gardening until I became an orthopedic surgeon. And it's an uncanny number of patients who come into me and say, my biggest problem is I can't maintain my garden um and it's very difficult to squat you know we, we sell a lot of those um gardening stools because you can't get down your knees like you used to when your joints hurt you know the simple activities of life become so difficult that you, you don't do them anymore and you take your mobility and you take your function for granted i don't know if any of you remember this many years ago time magazine put an article out the, the coming epidemic of arthritis. And it was a big news statement. And I don't know if it's truly an epidemic or it's just that we're diagnosing the patients earlier uh, and more numbers of patients with arthritis than we ever did in the past. And the best way to diagnose arthritis is just with a simple x-ray. Um, I have many patients come to me with MRIs, bone scans, ultrasounds, all these things are, are important imaging studies, but the best study is just a simple weight-bearing x-ray. And on this x-ray, the top bone is the femur, the bottom bone is the tibia, and that beautiful space between the femur and the tibia, it's not true space. This person is standing, but there's no calcium in the cartilage. So when the person is standing there, you do want to see that adequate space, which proves that there's abundance of cartilage and the patient's able to glide freely. By contrast, this is an arthritic knee. So the same femur and tibia, but there's no space between the two bones. And that's what you see on an arthritic knee, that bone on bone contact, which is excruciatingly painful. And people say, why does arthritis hurt so much? It's very simple. The cartilage has no nerve endings. So when cartilage is in contact and grinds on itself, you don't feel it. The cartilage is not innervated. Where the bone is heavily innervated, it has sensory fibers, it has the ability to feel discomfort when you break a bone, you know how painful that is. So we have an arthritic joint when the bone contacts other bone, you have two sides of that joint screaming in pain as the nerves are being grossly irritated. And with this x-ray, you see as the knee is collapsing in the one direction, the other side of the ligaments are getting stretched out. This is a nice picture of a pelvis on your right, you see the normal hip with a nice normal ball and socket, a nice normal amount of space on the left. 
you see the bone uh, on bone contact. The head is no longer a nice round sphere. It's flattened. And it, there's no cartilage remaining on that hip on your left, which says abnormal. You can have another process that affects joints as well. It's called avascular necrosis. And it's a fancy word, but it really just means bone death. So when somebody has a heart attack, a part of their heart muscle dies. When somebody has a bone attack, a portion of the bone dies. And this patient, the picture on your right, you see that hip is migrating north into the pelvis as the bone is no longer supporting that joint because the bone is dying. This is a patient with arthritis of both knees, hardly arthritic. There are patients who also have only arthritis on one side of the knee. And there are treatment modalities for all of these. This knee, you can't see any space at all. It's just complete bone and bone collapse. You almost wonder how this person even gets into your office. How do they hobble down the hallway? There are 55 million people with arthritis in 2018. That number is way higher today. Uh, that's one out of every six or one out of every two families as a person in a family afflicted with arthritis. This is an excerpt from that Time Magazine article. Um, the image that you see, the cartilage on the bone, um, where it says damage to the cartilage, that cartilage should look like on the, on the very bottom of that screen, that box on the far left, that beautiful, healthy cartilage. It's very, very strong. It, it resists shear, it resists compression. It can last for an entire lifetime, where the small box in the center of the screen on the bottom, the cartilage is failing. That cartilage can't resist compression. It can't resist shear. That cartilage propagates destruction as it fails even quicker. So with arthritis, obviously, what you see on the x-rays is just complete bone and bone collapse. The cysts in the bone, people wonder, am I saying a tumor? Am I saying cancer? No. What the bone cyst is, as the bones are in contact, as they compress, the joint fluid is driven into the bone because the cartilage protects the bone. If there's no cartilage to protect the bone, the joint fluid has a pathway into the bone and it creates these large cysts full of fluid. And then bone spurs, we're not certain where bone spurs come from, but it's hypothesized that as the joint is becoming painful, the body tries to stabilize that joint by making it have less motion. So you lay down all these bone spurs around the joint trying to stabilize that joint. When I was in high school and I asked the teacher what the answer to a difficult problem was, and the teacher responded, well, it's a multifactorial answer. I knew in the back of my head the teacher didn't know the answer. But when a patient asks me what's the cause of arthritis, I mean, the answer is that it's a multifactorial disease of joints. You know, it's abnormal anatomy. It's overuse. It certainly is genetics. Uh, and what I mean by abnormal anatomy, have you ever heard of a young baby had a hip click or this plastic hip? Those young adults, as they become adults, those hips can become very arthritic very early in life. Overuse, you know, how many times do I see a, a poor female who played high school and college softball on her knees for all those years and her knees are failing or a marathon one? But it's not just overuse because there are many people who exercise late into their lives and have no problem with their joints. So it's more than just overuse. And genetics, you know, if your parents have arthritis, your incidence of arthritis is certainly much higher than the normal population, but it's also not one-on-one -on -one handed down genetics as, you know, pattern baldness and eye color. It's not that predictable. It's just that your chance of arthritis is certainly much higher if it runs in your family. Daily, people ask me, what are the treatment options for arthritis? It's very simple weight reduction. And why do I say weight reduction? Because every time your foot hits the ground when you're walking, every time your heel strikes, it's three times gravity. So if you weigh 200 pounds, every time your heel hits the floor, it's a 600 pound force across that knee. If you're running and airborne, if you go up in the air and land, it's seven times gravity across that joint. 
So if you're a 200 pound individual and you're trying to jog, you have 1400 pounds of force across your joints every single heel strike. So weight reduction makes a massive difference in the comfort of your joints. Activity modification, what does that mean? That means if you know you're gonna to go to the grocery store for a big shopping trip, or you're gonna to go to BJ's, or you're gonna go golfing, or you're gonna go play with the grandkids at, at their soccer meet. If you know this is gonna happen, you have no problem, you can take over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, which is Motion or Advil or Tonal, or you can take prescription strength things, or you know you can take your cane, you can take a stool to sit if you need to sit and rest, or you know, like your, your sports chair. I know my parents always had chairs they brought with them to all the kids' sporting events. They can sit and rest. And, and the simple activity of, 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 move, of knowing what you're going to do and preparing can make a big difference. Uh, we're going to get into the medications a little bit later, but there's over-the-counter and there's prescription stuff. There's injections. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Ambulatory device. What does that mean? Well, if I tell you to put a cane in your hand, in your right hand, that cane will eliminate the joint reactive force on your left leg by 50%. So using a cane in your right hand lowers your joint reactive force or the trauma to your left leg by 50%. It can make a massive difference. You can take somebody who can't go to church and now they can because they have a cane. The last resort for anyone is surgery. I mean, that's the last. The surgery should only be discussed if all conservative measures have failed first. Why do I put the bottom line in there? Encourage maintaining activity level. It's very simple. Your cartilage, even your damaged cartilage that you have left, that cartilage is nourished and maintained and healthy as joint fluid passes back and forth across it. So if you stop using your joints, your cartilage will degrade at a much faster rate. So simple motion, walking, cycling, swimming, all of these things nourish and keep your cartilage healthy and happy. So we're gonna break this down to the medications. There's oral non steroidal anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter things, which is aspirin, Tylenol, Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Uh, and when I say non steroid just it's exactly what it says. It's not a steroid. These are anti-inflammatories. Then there are prescription strength non steroidals which is Naproxen, Relafin, Mobic, Duexis, Celebrex. There are a plethora of these. There are downsides to these anti-inflammatories. And the biggest downside is kidney toxicity. Prolonged exposure to anti-inflammatories can really cause renal damage. I don't put anybody on anti-inflammatories for over a year of time without checking their kidney function. And their most renal physicians will tell the orthopedic surgeons, please don't put my patients on these anti-inflammatories. Tylenol is the only anti-inflammatory that's not metabolized to the kidney. That goes through the liver. But these all can take someone who can't function and turn them into functional. These are ads out of People Magazine for Celebrex. Um, and it does work well. I mean, I've taken it myself in the past. And I've, I've written thousands of prescriptions for it. It does work very nicely. And the beauty of the Celebrex, it's just once a day. Uh, and it doesn't have the same GI toxicity as some of the other anti-inflammatories. This is my boyfriend, Joe Namath, and yes, that's me. When I was a little boy, my parents sent me to Joe Namath's football camp, and who's the spokesman for Meloxicam, but Joe Namath. So I met him at one of the meetings, but Meloxicam is also a once-a-day anti-inflammatory. That works very well for arthritis, but again, the problem with these anti-inflammatories, prolonged exposure can certainly affect your kidneys, and you also cannot use these anti-inflammatories on people who are taking blood thinners like Xarelto or Coumadin or Plavix, the anti-inflammatories grossly uh, alter the bleeding times. There are over-the-counter dietary supplements. This is probably one of the biggest money makers for the vitamin companies uh, in this country, hands down. Um, they sell arthritis remedies in the uh, nutritional stores, you know, glucosamine, conjoint sulfate, MSM, Osteobioflex, shark cartilage, these things are all marketed as dietary supplements. The downside of, of these supplements are they were pushed through the federal government as dietary aids. They have zero research, zero data to support any of the efficacy regarding arthritis. 
and they will flat out lie on the packaging. These medications do not rebuild cartilage. They do not lubricate joints. The Nobel Prize winning invention of all time will be the medicine that you can take by mouth that remedies arthritis and it has not been invented yet. This is the box from the osteobiflex. And I really despise that our government allows these people to flat out lie. And the lies on this are, it rebuilds cartilage. Well, no, it doesn't. The other lies of lubrication joints, it does not. And the third lie, which isn't a true lie, but to me is upsetting, is how expensive these things are. Uh, and they really hone in on the patients and say that these are the best things in sliced bread to treat your arthritis when they truly are not. And they tell you, you got to buy a 90 day supply to see if it's going to work. If you take something for a month and it's not working, it's not going to work. So these people are really preying on the arthritic patients. Then there's another modality for arthritis, which is injections. And there's really two injections you can do. There's the visco supplementation, which I know you've all heard of as the rooster injection or the chicken injection. Uh, the visco supplementation is, all it is is joint fluid, it's hyaluronic acid. And the joint fluid is so thickened, it's as thick as Vaseline and it acts as a cushion for the knee. So the visco supplementation is really, really good to give you a little bit of cushion for your joint, but the visco supplementation was pushed through the federal government as an implant. So there was no drug testing on it. Um, it has very mixed results. It is very expensive, but the beauty of it is it's not a steroid. And why is that important? If I have a patient with diabetes, and I do have a lot of patients with diabetes, you really can't give them a steroid shot because the steroid makes their blood sugars go through the moon. But the steroid shot is much more predictable than the visco supplementation as far as results. So I certainly do an awful lot more steroid injections than I do visco supplementation. Um, and the steroids I can repeat every three months. The visco supplementation, it's a whole approval process with the insurance, and at most you can do it twice a year. Um, and the predictability of the steroid shot is much better than that of the visco supplementation. I can, I can predict what the results will be using a steroid shot more easily than I can with, this, with the lubricating jelly. This is uh, Nancy Lopez, our golfer. She is a big proponent for Synvis. Um, she's their advertising. These are all pictures out of People magazine. Physical therapy. Why physical therapy for arthritis if you can't move? Well, it can certainly help you with range of motion, endurance, gait training, and strength. It can also teach you exercises you can do for yourself to maintain at home. Uh, aquatic rehab I use only for the patients who can't do land therapy. Aquatic rehab is great, but none of us live in the water. So my preference is to get you to do land therapy where you're capable of participating in normal activities of life on land. And a stationary bike is fantastic. All of us have access to a bike. Just riding the bike can lubricate your ankles, hips, and knees and really give you new leads on life. Indications for surgery. It is 100% a patient's decision. And it's a quality of life decision. If you cannot stand the lack of function, if your life is altered at every decision because of your arthritis, it's time to think about getting something done. Um, it has to be painful. If you have painless joints, there's nobody in the world is gonna touch you. You have to have pain because you're gonna go through pain to get your joint replacement done, I can tell you that. Decreased function, but of utmost importance, you have to have failed all conservative care. When I say failure of conservative care, that's your oral anti-inflammatory, that's injections, that's physical therapy, that's an ambulatory device, it may even be a brace. There's so many things to do prior to surgery. Um, my best answer for when patients say, how do you know it's time? It's very easy. When your hip or your knee doesn't let you play with the grandkids, doesn't let you go to church, doesn't let you participate in the functions you wanna do, it's time. 2022 Medicare data showed there's 2,400,000 joints done in the United States last year. This is that same picture of our bilateral knee patient who had horrible arthritis on both sides. And I won't do both knees at once. And there are arguments in both directions. Um, and the reason I won't do them both at once is 
When I do two knees at once, the patient's virtually a cripple for at least a week or two. Because when I do one knee, believe it or not, the knee I didn't do is their good knee and they can at least function temporarily until the new knee I just did gets better. This gentleman did a stage fashion. I just did his right knee first and he came back to the left seat, nothing at a different date. Hips. You know, I am a, a strong proponent of not using any cement for hips. So I pressed up my hips very snugly into the bone. I put them in there so tight that they don't move. And over the course of time, your bone grows onto it and holds it still. Um, the press fit hips have worked very, very well for many, many years. This is a patient who has arthritis really on one side of the joint, not both. And this person just got a partial knee. And so you hear about people getting these partial knees all the time. What that means is, if you think of the knee as three joints in one, it's the kneecap joint, the medial joint, and the lateral joint. We just fix the patient's medial joint only. The downside of this procedure is the rest of the knee can continue to degrade and fall apart over time. And often you have to change these patients to a total knee in the future. If someone's going to talk about surgery with you, they have to talk about how long will it take to recover. Um, to get free of a walker, to get free of an assistive device, walker and crutches, it's probably three to six weeks for a knee and five to eight weeks for a hip. To walk normally, no limp, have a normal gait pattern, and normal function. For a knee, it's two to three months, and for a hip, it's a little bit longer. And you will walk normally, but you need to know that you don't get your joint on Monday and you're fine on Tuesday. It's a three month recovery process. This was a big catchphrase years ago, and they're not really speaking about this anymore much, but it's still brought up in my office every day. People wanted to have the minimally invasive knee. And basically everybody does this. I wouldn't say that this is a marketing tool for any group. I mean, every group always makes the smallest incision possible that you can certainly see and do the knee well. Um, there's another method called quadriceps sparing knee, which has its pluses and minuses. And, you know, nobody really cuts the quadricep tendon. Everybody will just move the quadricep tendon over to do the surgery. So it's sort of, that was sort of advertised erroneously in the past. Um, the less dissection, the smaller incision you make, the less trauma you do to the tissues, the faster you can recover. Uh, but I won't kid you, a joint replacement hurts like a Dickens. Um, and anybody who says you're not kind of pain after surgery would be, would be not telling the truth. Um, the tissue sparing joint replacements, like I said, you get a little bit less scarring and more mobility. If someone's going to discuss surgery, they have to discuss the complications. What, what phlebitis is, it's a blood clot. Anytime you do extremity surgery, you have an, a joint that's traumatized and you have vascular stasis, and you have a chance of a blood clot. So after every single surgery we do, we use aspirin for DVD prophylaxis, or if they have a history of clots in the past, you'll either use Coumadin or Xarelto or one of the uh, more potent anti-inflammatories. Infection is a disaster. What, what infection means is I've done your surgery, you're in the recovery process, maybe two, three weeks, five weeks down the line, and that joint becomes infected. An infected joint is a disaster. That joint has to be removed. You have to treat the infection, cure the infection, come back at a later date and put a new knee, new knee or new hip in that joint after the infection clears. And I always get asked, why did you have to take the joint out? It's very simple. That metal and plastic joint replacement has no blood supply. It cannot deliver white cells. It cannot fight the infection. So it's like that stagnant pond in your backyard in the summer that the mosquitoes love. But if the water's flowing through that pond, then there's no still water, the mosquitoes can't stay in it. So when you get an infection, the joint has to come out. A hip dislocation. What that means is you had your hip replacement, then it starts to dislocate. And that should not happen. Um, and it does happen at a very low rate, thank God. But if your hip's dislocating, usually it's a, it's a fault and the surgeon did put something in correctly. That should not happen. A stiff knee. That means you had a knee replacement, and as time goes by, you don't get that full normal range of motion. And that can happen because the scar tissue, it can happen because the joint's too big, it can happen because your motion before surgery was terrible, but the best predictor of range of motion of a knee replacement is truly what the range of motion of that knee was before surgery. The results, how long do these things last? So at 10 years, you should really have a 98% chance of that joint going just fine. At 15 years, 95% chance. 
I always tell patients who are 65 years of age or older, the joint you have, you'll have forever. You'll never wear it out. The whole process of arthritis, it is truly a team approach. And the captain of the team is the patient. It's you. You have to take charge. You have to tell me the medicine I gave you is not cutting it. We need to try something else. You need to tell me that injection I gave you six months ago really worked well. Can you repeat it? You need to tell the therapist, you know, what he's doing is making it worse, not better. You got to change your routine. The patient controls the care. Uh, and it's all about the patient's happiness and function afterward. Um, and there's a whole team of people who do this. I mean, I'm involved, the nurses, the hospital, uh, and the whole rehab staff, and also all the girls in the office are involved. It's a very big process to get a joint done. Thank you. And that's my talk. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions. If anybody else has um, questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat if you want to open those up and let me know if you are having any issues with that, Dr. Har. I got gotcha. you. So the first question is, can I explain more about the brace my father was wearing when fishing, the pluses and minuses, the pros and cons? So that's called an unloader brace. And what that brace does, it, it allows mobility. It's a hinge brace. He has... Um, the ability to walk and function with it, but it adds external support to the knee, which means outside of his knee joint, there's hinges on that brace that don't allow lateral movement. Uh, and it also provides stability uh, for anterior posture move movement as well. So it takes a, a gentleman, my father, who really struggled on the boat and made him be able to function on the boat. Um, the downside of the braces are very expensive. Um, if your insurance pays for it, that's awesome. But the braces cost a fortune. Uh, they are cumbersome in the, in the summer. Uh, they can cause acne on your skin because that black neoprene gets heated up and starts sweating. Uh, so they can be very, very uncomfortable to wear. And there are patients who have the body habits, but I just can't get a brace on. Uh, and those are patients with very, very big, big thighs and small calves that, that are like a triangle. The brace will just slide right down to the knee. Um, I think anything is worthwhile before surgery. So if you had a bad knee and a brace is an option, I would 100% try that brace before you jump down the path of surgery. Because once you go down the path of surgery, there's no going back. It's all over. Number two. So this question was, this meeting was about hips and knees. Can I speak more about hands? I am not a hand specialist, but your hands, probably the most common joint for arthritis is your distal, is the index finger, distal interphalangeal joint. Um, and your boy, I tell you what, you really lose function when your hands go out of business. Um, and we have a whole plethora of hand surgeons at Rothman who take care of this diligently and very well. Uh, and I bet they're going to have a hand seminar one day, right? Oh yeah, we have, um, I'll have to look at the schedule, but otherwise we can, we'll definitely schedule one. Yeah. Actually, we just had one last week, actually. So. All right. Um, okay. Here's a good one. It says, are there any foods that are either good or bad for arthritis? And this is, a, a, I get to ask this question every day. There has never been a diet or a food stuff or a food uh, group that has been shown to be beneficial at the prevention or the improvement of arthritis. Uh, and it's been studied at length. So there's no one food that has been shown you should eat this food, you won't get arthritis. So if anybody's telling you that there's a food that's great for arthritis, it's really a misstatement. It's never been shown. Um, my thoughts on Voltaren gel. So Voltaren gel is diclofenac, but it's just put on the skin. Um, and you rub it into your arthritic joints, the penetration rate of that gel is probably a little bit under 10%, which is fine. Um, and I use the Voltaren gel in patients who are on blood thinners and patients who have kidney disease because it's not as toxic to the system as taking it by mouth. And it does work very well. I use an awful lot. It, it works so well that the federal government allowed it to be off um, prescription and now it's over the counter. So I, I use Voltaren gel every day. It has a great spot. It's probably very good for hands too, for patients with a hand arthritis. 
And do uh, stem cells help arthritis? So you'll hear a lot of people talk about taking your platelet-rich uh, plasma and spinning it down and injecting those stem cells into your joints to help with arthritis. And it's a very expensive process. And at the beginning of time, we used to do this here at Rothman, but we've done all the research on this and it's clearly shown that the stem cells do not provide any benefit for arthritis. So we actually abandoned that program. We do not do it anymore, but you certainly can find a lot of people out there who do the stem cell injections. Uh, but in reality, it's a very expensive process that doesn't provide any benefit or gain. So we, we do not do the stem cells anymore. Uh, here's another one. It says, can you explain the pros and cons of anterior, posterior, and lateral hip replacement? Yes. This lecture for this question could take a month, but I'll sum it up. Um, your hip surgeon is comfortable with any procedure that you're doing. So whatever procedure your hip surgeon is comfortable doing, that's the, 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 the approach you want them to do. There's no data, there's no research to show that any one approach is better than another. Uh, it's clearly just demonstrated that whatever approach the surgeon is comfortable with, that's the one he should be doing. And the statistics on dislocation, infection, limb lengthening, limp, all those statistics are, are equivalent for all, of, all the different approaches. I do anterior and anterior lateral approach. I no longer do the posterior approach. But that's just because uh, it's just much easier for me to do that approach. Um, and there's no, there's no scientific data or research to say, like I said, that any one of those is better than another. They are all equivalent. Um, how much Advil is good for a day? So, you know, I would tell my patients the most I would have them take, two, four, six, 800 milligrams a day is the most I let them take. So that's, two over-the-counter pills four times a day. And even that, I wouldn't want them taking that for any more than a couple of days. If the pain is that great that you need to take more than eight Advil a day for more than a few days, then you have to see somebody. That's a lot of Advil. And that's a very, very big toxic load to your kidneys. And does Tylenol damage your liver? Yes, the Tylenol is excreted through the liver. Um, it would take a heck of a lot of Tylenol to knock your liver off. And your liver is an incredibly strong dynamic organ. It's much stronger than your kidneys. Um, but if you're taking enormous amounts of Tylenol, now they have the over-the-counter the over the counter arthritic strength Tylenol, 650 milligrams. So if you take two of those, you know, that's 1,300 milligrams of Tylenol. I wouldn't do that more than once or twice a day. I, again, I wouldn't want you to do it more than a few days. If you're taking Tylenol at that extreme number for weeks on, on end, you need to see something because that's too much. And that, that's sometimes the patient who, if he received an injection, you can stop taking the oral anti inflammatories for a while and give your kidneys and liver a break. Um, doc, that first question, they talk about foods, but then there's a second part that says, um, What are your thoughts on prednisone for treatment instead of Celebrex? I, I, I don't use steroids uh, by mouth almost ever. And I, I obviously I have a very strong bias for that because as a hip surgeon, I see all these patients who had a steroid dose and now have avascular necrosis of the femoral heads and require a joint replacement because the steroid can trigger a, a bone infarct. Um, so rather than taking prednisone, which in itself can be a, a detriment, I, I would rather use an anti-inflammatory. I think the steroid, the prednisone steroids are much more dangerous than just a simple anti-inflammatory. So I, I see a question, I, I don't understand. I think it says my kneecap joint is destroyed, but the rest of the knee is fine. They used to make, and some of the companies still do, uh, replacement just for the patella femoral joint. And I don't do that because uh, I revised a zillion of them because it, they don't seem to work very well. So I, I, my own patients who have isolated arthritis in the patella femoral joint, I, I do exactly the same path. I do all the conservative measures. I do injections, anti-inflammatories. Those patients actually respond pretty well 
the visco supplementation. But when push comes to shove and conservative measures fail for the patella femoral arthritis, uh, I would tell those patients rather than do just a patella femoral replacement, I would do the whole thing. Yeah, so there's one here about 600 milligram Motrin. Um, 600 milligram Motrin is fine. Uh, you know, you can do that twice a day. I have no problem doing that with prolonged periods of time. But if I have my patients on an anti-inflammatory for over three months, I want to get liver function tests and kidney tests. So, and the kidney test is just simply um, your BUN and creatinine, make sure that your kidneys are functioning well. And, that, and it's easy, it's a simple lab test. But, yeah, 600 milligram. There's many different doses of ibuprofen, two, four, six, eight. So a 600 milligram Motrin is not bad. So again, I was asked, why didn't I mention platelet-rich plasma or stem cells? Uh, I didn't mention it because there is zero um, data and zero research to show that the stem cells and the platelet-rich plasma is beneficial in the treatment of arthritis. Now, of course, you're going to hear Many patients who said they had the platelet-rich plasma, they're doing awesome, they're gonna do it again, which is fine. And I'm sure that there are patients that it will help, but the real hard data on it shows that it doesn't stop the progression of arthritis and doesn't improve the arthritis that you already have. That's why I didn't mention it. Here's one, I live alone, can I recover from a hip surgery? You know, um, I would tell you 50% of the patients I do live at home alone, and that's one of my questions when I meet you. Do you have any support at home? And if you don't have any support at home, I, I would have no problem giving you an extra day or two in the hospital to get your wits about you, have physical therapy, have you independent so that you can go home. And when you do get a joint replacement, especially on the right side, obviously those patients can't drive for a couple of weeks. So if I did a right hip replacement and the patient lives at home alone, I would keep them in the hospital for a little while longer, make sure they're independent, when I say independent, they have to get themselves in and out of bed, going off the toilet, up and down stairs, get in and out of a car, be able to mobilize on their own. I'll send them home with a walker and I'll have a therapist come to their house until they can drive. And with a right lower extremity surgery, it's usually about three weeks till I let you drive. So I do many, many patients live home alone all the time, yes. What medication is best for arthritis flare-ups? You know, I think there's many. You know, I, I have patients who swear by Tylenol arthritis. I have patients who say Tylenol doesn't do a damn thing. I have patients who swear by Advil over Motrin. Um, you're going to have to find which one works for you best. And I would tell you to try the over-the-counter things first. And if the over-the-counter things aren't helping, there are a plethora of prescription strength things we can also try. And some of the prescription anti-inflammatories are actually safer for your GI tract than the over-the-counter ones, uh, especially like the Mobic and the Celebrex. They don't seem to rip your stomach apart as much. Um, as a follow-up, somebody else was asking about gabapentin for arthritis pain. <clears throat> you know, we use the gabapentin more for nerve pain and um, almost like radicular pain. I don't use it directly for arthritic pain, but I do use it in combination with anti-inflammatories. Sometimes you do a joint replacement, and the patient will have this nerve pain radiating down their leg or about the knee. And the gabapentin works really well for uh, that sort of nerve-related pain. So there, there, there is definitely a spot to use it. But the gabapentin does not act directly at the joint level. It acts at the nerve level. Um, I see an interesting one here. Someone's asking about if it hurts to do a stationary bike, should you push through the pain? Well, my rule of thumb for all exercise is very simple. You can do anything you want as long as it does not make you pay the price for it tomorrow. So if you push it on the bike, stationary bike, and you really push it, and tomorrow you're a cripple, then obviously you did too much. But if you push it on the stationary bike and you really push it, and tomorrow you're fine, you can do it again, then that's fine. So everybody's a little bit different. And I have your pain limit your activity levels, but I need you to stay active. So if you're riding that bike and you're able to continue to ride the bike, that is absolutely fine. But like I said, if you pay the price for it, then you have to alter your activities. And it's really simple. Your body can control what you can control. So if your body is saying no, then it's no. Um, and here's one. Um, are steroid injections better than visco supplementation? 
I think they're better uh, in my hands for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's very reproducible, uh, and I can really predict how much relief you're going to get with the steroid shot. Um, it's pennies. Steroids are very, very inexpensive. There's no pre-authorization necessary. I don't have to get in touch with your insurance company. There's no massive copay with the steroid shot. Um, and I can do it every three months instead of every six. The viscous supplementation is very expensive. Uh, there's a whole insurance pre-approval. In fact, we have an entire division of our Rothman that their only job is for viscous supplementation pre-authorizations, which is a gigantic hassle. Uh, the patients come in for treatment. I can't treat them right away. I have to send them out until the viscous supplementation gets approved. Then when it, when it gets approved, then they can come back and see me again. And then we start the jellies. Uh, but like I said, the jellies are best in patients with very brittle diabetes. They can't do a steroid shot in. Uh, they're best in patellofemoral arthritis. Uh, they're best in uh, earlier arthritis. The later the arthritis is, the steroid shot seems to work better. Um, what affects arthritis more, barometric pressure, temperature, or humidity, or none? Yes. Wow. Um, you know, just with no data or no science behind it, I mean, looking at my old patients, they uh, really like Florida in the winter and they don't like Jersey in the summer. So, <laughs> so I guess the humidity is probably not good. Um, and I have patients who sometimes do better in cold than in hot. It's, it's hit or miss. I've had, I've had as many patients say when it's nice and warm out, they can function better. And I've had equal number of patients say when it's nice and cold out and it's bitter, I feel better. So I don't think there's one way or the other. It's, it's truly how it makes you feel. And that's how you'd react to it. Okay. Um, just to last, um, is an anti-inflammatory diet bogus? Yes. Any of those diets that you read about, uh, the diets are all um, written by lay people that they're not in the medical field. Uh, they're trying to tell you that you can eat something by mouth that's gonna help arthritis. And that, like I said, that's the Nobel Prize winning invention of all time. When somebody invents something you can take by mouth that cures arthritis, that would be the greatest invention ever done. Um, what should I expect getting up from a chair and going up steps after knee replacements? I guess activity after. Yeah, so the first couple of weeks, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, in fact, the first couple of weeks, the joint I didn't do is the joint you use to go up and down stairs. And then the tides change as the joint we did recovers and becomes more reliable, more functional and stronger. Then the joint we did becomes your dominant joint. Um, and it does take time. It takes somewhere weeks to a month for the joint replacement to be the one that you can do stairs with easily. Uh, and I always tell everybody the last, last thing that gets better with the knee is your ability to easily descend stairs, not ascend, descend, because you got to leave that leg behind. It has to bend so much to let the other leg hit the, the step below. So descending stairs is the last thing that improves. Um, and one last question. I'm 72 and have swelling in my lower legs. Can I have a hip replacement or something else? You know, when I have patients with lymphedema or gross swelling uh, and they have, if they have a big fire engine red leg, if they have erythema and cellulitis, you know, I won't touch a patient with infection. If it's just swelling, I will usually have them see a vascular surgeon prior to me doing their hip or knee to make sure their vascular status is appropriate. Uh, if they don't have appropriate uh, vascular status, then you're not a candidate. But if it's just swelling, I do patients with swollen legs all the time. Sometimes it's just a matter of a diuretic. Sometimes it's a matter of compression stockings. But when I have a swollen patient, I will always have them see a vascular surgeon first. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we hit all of the questions. So I'll say thank you so much. This was really informative. I learned something during all of these presentations. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, you can email me. The email should be in, um, my email address should be in the email that you received to uh, join us tonight. Um, and I can run any questions past him. If you need help scheduling an appointment, I'm always here to help also. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank oh, we you, got everybody. a couple people. Hop in. Oh, they're just saying thank you. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was really, really informative. Well, have a great night, guys. Enjoy right, your good summer. Night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.